26, verses 26 through 29. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to, it for God, thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I think if we look at the story of the Last Supper, of that Passover meal celebrated between the disciples and Jesus, I wonder what the disciples were thinking as Jesus did this. I mean, it would have been normal for a rabbi to, to break the bread for his disciples. But then for Jesus to take the bread and say that this is my body, broken for you. I mean, sure, they knew at some point Jesus was going to die. Jesus had just confirmed to them that one of them around the table was going to betray him. But yet, did they know what that broken body meant? They knew Jesus was going to die. They didn't know how he was going to die, though. And so I'm sure this language, as, as we read it today, and, and as the disciples were experiencing it, weren't really sure what to think of any of it. Let alone, then he gets to the blood, which he says, this is my blood. That confirms the new covenant. That reestablishes not only the chosen people, but establishes all people. If we look at... The communion celebrated on the Passover, it was the very first communion. And the very reason why we celebrate communion still today, 2,000 years later. Because that body was broken. That blood was spilled. Not only for the disciples, but later for the disciples' disciples. And the first church. The first church is, the multitude of churches, and even in today's times of me and you, that body is broken and that blood is shed for us. So as I pray, I will come down afterwards and grab a cup, and then you can file down and grab a cup and take it back to your seat, or there's a trash can in the back there. But this is a time to remember and reflect upon what this day truly means. It means in terms of Jesus, in terms of the disciples and what they were about, about to go through, and in terms of what that means for us and how we honor that in our time. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time where we have the freedom to be able to gather as a body of believers, as ones who follow after Christ and follow in his command to eat this. This is my body broken for you. And to drink this blood that confirms the covenant, making you right between God and man. Lord, thank you that we get the honor to be considered righteous before God because of Jesus' sacrifice. May we not be lost on that. It's in Jesus' most holy name I pray. Amen.
Good evening, everyone. I want to say, make sure I started with that in case I slipped up and said good morning. You'll notice I titled this The Ultimate Love Story. The Ultimate Love Story. And I probably changed the title of this at least seven times throughout this week. But really, when it comes down to it, if we look at this here, it is the ultimate love story. From beginning to end, it is about God's love for his people, which later becomes God's love for us as well. In fact, God's love so much that he's willing to send his son back again to save us finally for eternity. One of my favorite, favorite sayings is from Genesis to Revelation, Jesus was plan A the whole time. There was no plan B. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden wasn't plan A. God knew what humanity was before humanity knew what humanity was was. And yet God still chose to give us a life that we could choose and to make our own decisions. To know that we would fail over and over again and yet he would still show us love. Still show us compassion. To the point where he destroyed the world one time. Restarted again. And then said, Finally, I will send my son and the ultimate sign of love. And that's what we celebrate today. Oftentimes, we can, get, we can get wrapped up in the stories of the New Testament when it comes to Good Friday. And we could read straight from the New Testament and the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we can get stuck in, in those details. And those, those are good. But I want to take a step back. I want us to look at the full scope of the Bible. Because everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. And then once the Gospels arrive, then we have Jesus on the scene. And then the rest of the New Testament tells us how to live a life that honors Jesus and brings glory to God. And so we have to look at the full Bible. We have to look at all 66 books that are given to us to see how much God truly loves us. And if we look at Isaiah, which isn't sure when it was written, but we're looking at 400 to 600 years before the birth of Jesus. 400 to 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And as I read this, it points directly to Jesus. And it will be obvious to us that it's Jesus that we're talking about. But yet, the first people to receive these words, the first people to read these words, would have been long expecting this Messiah to come and save them. Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There is nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. If we look at the first two verses here, it tells us exactly what Jesus is going to look like. Nothing special. Sorry to the early Renaissance painters and the early medieval painters. He wasn't that radioactive, glowing baby with a halo around his head. That wasn't him with blonde hair and blue eyes. He's stood out no more than any other average baby or average child of his time. In fact, it says here in verse, right before verse, right near the end of verse 2, like a root in dry ground. It shows us he's going to be born into a place that's not all that great either. Much like a small town of Fredericksburg, Ohio. Are there people that say what good can come from Fredericksburg? Well, what good can come from a child from Nazareth? In a place of nobodies, in a land of nobodies, growing up looking like a nobody, that was going to be the Messiah. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him, and he looked the other way, and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. 
Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment from his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. I can't imagine Jesus growing up and knowing what his calling was to be. I don't know if he fully grasped it or if if God slowly over time revealed to him what was going to happen. But we can tell from an early age when Joseph and Mary forgot him or left him behind that he was in his father's house teaching even the priests and the preachers at the time about his father, things they had never heard before. They were astounded at his wisdom and had no idea where he had picked any of this up. I guess that happens when you live eternity with God before you come to earth. And yet all of that knowledge, all of that wisdom, even at 12 years old, even that life he lived of miracles, of healing the blind, of telling a lame man to walk and he walks, knowing the entire life story of a woman at a well. All of these good things happening, but because he did it on a Sabbath, he was persecuted, rejected, ridiculed, considered a heretic and a blasphemer, considering the very enemy of God. The very men who were supposed to lead Israel lead the early Jewish people to the Messiah were the ones that were pulling them away the most. He brought peace and we offered his destruction. He brought wisdom and we chose blindness. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Jesus prays at least twice for the cup to be taken from his hand. He prays that maybe there is a different way. But yet he also prays that God's will be done. Can you imagine that? Praying for God's will despite everything going on around you. Despite the pain, despite the costs, Despite everything you know you're about to go through, he chose God's will above all things. And yet he did not rebuke anybody who came against him. Through the whipping and the scourging and the hits and the laughter and the mocking, he said nothing. He said nothing. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants because many will choose him. Many will come to him. Many will choose him as their savior. He will enjoy a long life because eternity is the longest life in heaven. And the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. It is because of his hands and his sacrifices that we are saved. Because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. We are now in that many who are counted as righteous because of his sacrifice, because of the work of Peter and Paul, who felt so strongly in their convictions that they went even to the point of death for Jesus. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. 
those who everyone else counted out, he considered friend. Everyone who everyone else despised and rejected, he counted as brother. He died so they could be lifted up, so they could be raised, so I could be raised. And as crazy as it seems, that's only the first part of the story. All of this written four to six hundred years before Jesus. And if that's not amazing enough, John paints us a picture in chapter 17 that's even more amazing than that. John chapter 17, John lets us in on a little bit of of Jesus' prayer before he was arrested. In verses 9, Jesus' prayer is no longer for himself. Jesus' prayer is for his disciples. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now I'm departing from the world. They are staying in the world, but I'm coming to you, Father. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are united. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that no one would be lost except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. Now I am coming to you. Jesus' time is drawing near. And he knows it. And he says, God, I I am excited because I'm finally coming back home. I'm coming to you, but I am scared for these men. My heart goes out to these men because of the work they are going to do. I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so that they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. We know that there's evil all around us. There's destruction all around us. Satan pries on division. And wants nothing more than division. He wants nothing more than to us slink away into the darkest recesses of our mind. Become isolated within ourselves. Maybe if we just isolate a little bit more, maybe we'll stay safe from what the world has. That's not Jesus' prayer for his disciples, and that should not be the prayer for us. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Jesus knew that he must die for this mission to take place. Jesus' prayer, verses 9 through 19, is, is an amazing thing. But then Jesus prays for me, and he prays for you in the next verse. Jesus prays for those who would continue to believe even after the disciples are gone. I'm praying not only for the disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Jesus says here, I'm not only praying for these disciples, but also for Josh. Also for Rick. Also for Jack, for Dee, for Donna, for Gary, for Jeff. He is praying for all of us who will believe. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and that I am in you. May they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. May they all be united as one. When it is so easy in the world we live in to sit at home, to watch a sermon online, to simply read a book and think that's enough, we need each other. Jesus says here, I want them to be one. I want them to be united. More than ever, we need to be united. We need to be together in the flesh together. Text messages are good. 
phone calls are good. Both of those work both ways. But most of all, human interaction. A handshake. A hug. A kiss on the cheek. That physical contact speaks more words than any of us could ever need. When we get down to it, all of that love that Jesus showed his disciples, all of that love that Jesus prayed for future disciples, it later gets put down into Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. So when the apostles were with Jesus the last time, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you free to, for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is when Jesus is coming back, when all people have had a chance to hear, when everyone has had an expectation of being able to say, yes, Lord, I believe. That is when Jesus is coming back. And I don't know about you, but it's been 2,000 years since Jesus spoke these words. Time doesn't go backwards, so that means we're going closer and closer to those days when Jesus returns. And these aren't things that we should fear. These are things that we should be expectantly waiting for. As Simeon waited for the birth of Jesus at the temple, we should also be expectantly waiting. After saying this, he was taken up in a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Jesus gave them a mission. And for three years, that was all they focused on was that mission. And all of a sudden, the man that they depended on for three years is gone. Is there something that you depend on that is is there something that your faith was predicated on that is just gone? Is your peace gone? Is it floating away from you? Is it almost there that you can grasp it? But yet at the same time, maybe you're too scared to take on that mission, much like these disciples were. Maybe you're too scared to grab on to that peace that is promised to us. Maybe you feel like you don't deserve it. But that's not what Jesus calls us to do. Jesus calls us to trust in him. To allow him control. To know that no matter what, we are inside his hands. Because whether we like it or not, whether we're scared of it or not, Jesus is coming again. And this time, we don't have to worry about the evil outside these walls. We won't have to worry about Satan's power over this world. All we have to worry about is believing and trusting that Jesus is who he says he is. And will come in with his blazing hair in his eyes of fire. And I can't wait for that day. I cannot wait for that day. I'll pray and then we'll go into another song. Actually, let this next song be our prayer. Let's use this next song as our prayer and then back up and I'll close out in prayer. And after I close out in prayer, there'll be another song. And then after that song ends, 
you'll see a message that God bless you. After that, you'll be dismissed. But let's use this song as our prayer here.